Shalom everyone, this is Rabbi Shlomo Katz. You're listening to the Soul of Israel on the landofisrael.com and the Land of Israel Network. Shalom Aleichem, my dear brother Jeremy, Rabbi Jeremy Gimpel. Thank you, Rabbi. How are you? Fantastic. Always a pleasure being together, discussing the portion of the week. Discussing the portion of the week in the realm of current, current events, past events, future events. Actually, I like talking about future events. Future events is awesome. Future events is cool. You know what? People don't fully appreciate because we just take it for granted. Like, oh, it's the Parsha this week. But Judaism is the only religion in the world that is reading from a specific text um, everywhere around the world all at the same time. Like a message is coming down from Shemaim to every single Jew around the world. A message to Am Yisrael. And it's like we can plug, you can meet a Jew in Hong Kong, in Toronto, in LA, and say, hey, what's the Parsha this week? And immediately there's a conversation because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is speaking to all of us exactly at this time, nationally, internationally, personally. It's like a message for all of us. Correct. It's an awesome opportunity. Correct. So thank you. And thank you all for plugging in. And there was, we, we got some incredible mail this last week. It was one woman specific wrote us a mail. I think it was to me and to you regarding last week's or the last time we broadcasted. Anyway, I just want you to let, let you all know that those emails might take you 20 seconds to share, but they travel 20 million miles deep into our hearts. So seriously, by all means, um, please reach out. D- don't don't hesitate. The show, this is not a show that we we feel stops when you start when you stop listening. This show, this segment, these segments really are are meant to be continuous throughout the week, throughout your day, to keep the conversations going from week to week. So please keep on reaching out to us. Shlomo at landofisrael dot com, Jeremy at landofisrael dot com, and of course when Ari's back from his reserve duty, <laughs> or even now if you'd like to just reach out and say Shalom Aleichem, how you doing? Ari at landofisrael dot com. I feel that these parshas are going too fast. Too know. fast. You feel I the know. same? I, we already Avram's away now. It, it's, yeah, yeah. It was. I read it last. I was in Shul Shabbos and it said, "Oh, and Abraham died." I'm like, "What? What? He just showed up." I know. He just showed up. Um, so this Shabbos, we, 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 we this portion of the week, we do get introduced to someone who sticks around for a little bit longer in terms of uh, the portions that he shows up in, and that's our father Jacob. And that's very, very special. And, and the transition from Jacob to Joseph then really spreads out. That, that's really the, the rest of the first book of Bereshit. And we still have a bunch of portions to get through. But saying goodbye to Avraham, uh, it kind of snuck up on me. And it was a little bit difficult. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I'm, I'm nervous the same thing's going to happen with Yitzchak, which it probably will uh, at the end of this Shabbos too. So it's very, very like you want to just savor the moment and just take it all in. And yet the Torah says, sorry. There's gotta something going. Yeah, you got to keep going. Got to keep going. And so we're I just already like to... yearning for next year where Avram comes back around again. <laughs> every year that I read these you portions too. of the yeah. pictures, every year it does something different to my soul, a different insight, because they were they were the very beginnings of Yiddishkeit. Yeah, They're like the beginnings of Jesus before there was Sinai and before there was Halacha and before the, they were like already tapping in yeah. to like the deepest depths of what it is to be a Yid in the world. Correct. They had what Rav Cook and Chazal refer to. They had something called Musar Klayot, which means ethic. Well, it really means like Kishka ethics, ethics of the kidneys, that the, that their kidneys, their, the most physical part of them, was so in tune with the Ratzon Elyon, with the higher supernal will, and they were living their lives being so plugged into something that we need so many reminders and so many different non-distractions in order to stay focused. The focus was just there by them. Yeah. And it's incredible. So there's one there's one thing I wanted to discuss today on our segment, which really is an embodiment of Yaakov Avinu. And uh, it, I'm trying to place the movie where the following phrase is from. Um, I think you might be able to help me with this. I'll we try. Can call our friend Yoni Berg or others. <laughs> I can with this. Um, we're not worthy. We're not worthy. What? Wayne's World. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Mike Myers, thank you. Yes. Mike Myers and Dana <laughs> Carvey. <laughs> You see, friends, it's fun when we get together. Yeah, now you know what I was doing when I'm in the ninth and tenth grade. <laughs> Correct. So we're not worthy. We're not worthy. There's a theme throughout Yiddishkeit. I don't know if it was just back in the day, if it's also today, where you're supposed to feel or you misunderstand the the phrase "we're not worthy." I don't feel worthy. Do you think God, when he gave us the Torah, was expecting us to say, we're not worthy? So then he would be like, oh, okay, so you guys are, you're right. You're not worthy. Uh, You shouldn't receive it. We're not worthy does not necessarily mean we're not worthy and therefore we don't deserve goodness. It means 
to have the ability to take in goodness despite the fact that you don't feel worthy. I find that a lot of times when I just want to open my heart and talk to Hashem, that I feel unworthy. Just like, come on, really? Just, it's like a barrier that I have to break through because I just feel like I'm just such a yutz and I'm just wasting a lot of time and I like should be doing better things. And I think about things that I've done in the past. It's just a barrier that really is a, it's like a machsom. It's like a, a, a veil that really needs to be pierced. And it's like it, all in my own perception. Clearly, HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves me because here I am alive and breathing and living in the land of Israel. It is the Yitzhar. I mean, can we just say it straight out? It's the Yitzhar, huh? Yeah, absolutely. We can. It's yeah. even the I, I think so. And he comes, he comes, mom is clothed. He looks like the biggest tzaddik when he comes and says that, right? You know, it's funny, friends. We, have, we, we get introduced and we'll see. Just stay with me for a second. This will take a little bit of time, but we'll get there. We have, in this parsha, we're introduced to the twins. Jacob and Esau. Rabbi Karbach used to say, don't think that Esau looked like a cold-blooded murderer. Esau walked around with a strimal and a kapata. <laughs> Esau looked really holy. You could see even the questions that he asks his father try to make him sound like he was a very pious, holy human being. However, quite often, the evil inclination sounds like the holiest entity uh, that exists in your life. You can see that also in Jewish history, the Nevi Eshek are the false prophets they looked really holy. They had long beards and they right. were speaking in the name of God and people were convinced that they're so holy. It's, it Correct. reminds me a lot of like sects of Judaism today that look so holy, but at the same time they're throwing stones on IDF soldiers and you're like, these people are false prophets, right. period. In right. our generation, we can see people that look so holy, that talk so holy, that are so quote unquote holy and yet still what they're doing is you know totally Asaph oh, yeah. Hashem should spare us from uh, getting confused with the eyesight. Um, this concept of feeling not worthy versus feeling worthy, Rabbi Karbach says is really the main difference between uh, Yaakov and Esav, is that Esav, um, if God, if he knew that God was looking to send some brachas someone, someone's way, so uh, Esav's the first to say, hey, remember, I'm the grandson of Avram, like, Whenever I say that, it always freaks me out that Esau was the grandson of Avram Avinu, but he was, right? So he's standing on a street corner saying, can, can there be someone that's more deserving of such brachas? And Yaakov Avinu is the first one to say, I'm not worthy. Why? Because I know how much deeper and better I could be. Someone that's what we've been talking about in the morning sessions called whole, cold-heartedness, tamim, tamimut. It says about Yaakov Avinu, he was an ishtam yeshev ohalim, he never feels that he's worthy of anything good that happens to him. And if something good does happen to him, he views it as a matnat chinam, as an undeserved gift. Esav is exactly the opposite. But one of the powers of Esav, of the, of the, of the evil inclination, it comes to you and tells you, listen, not only are you not worthy, even if it's being stuffed down your throat, the goodness, the shefa, the brachas, the abundance, who are you kidding? Run away from it as fast as you can. And we see that in our portion of the week, that when, why did Jacob's mother, Rivka, why did she have to like rush him really fast and push him to go and receive the blessings from his father Yitzchak, from his father Isaac? That's basically the portion that we have in front of us, the Shabbos. Rivka hears she wants to give blessings, that Yitzchak wants to give blessings. And she knows the power of Yitzchak's blessings and she hears that he's going to be giving them to the wrong side without getting too involved in the depths of that right now. She goes and she rushes to her son Yaakov and says, listen, go and get your act together. You need to receive certain blessings. And it almost seems you could, you could hear what the Torah doesn't say is that she, has to, she had to push him. She had to force him to go and receive those blessings. So other than the explanation of he didn't want to do anything that wasn't 100% yashar, straight, the mystics tell us there was something else that was preventing him from going to do it so fast. Is that he said, who am I to receive such blessings? I'm not worthy of it. I'm not that worthy. And he wasn't saying it from an unholy place. He was saying it from a very holy place. However, sometimes it's even holier to ignore those voices which come up and creep up in the name of holiness like what you just brought up, Jeremy. Sometimes I want to talk to Hashem. 
But I stop, right? And I, what do I say? What, what, what did you just say before? Yeah, I just feel like unworthy. Because I literally that, that either my sins of my past or who I haven't been or who I should be. I just feel like ugh, I just I'm not deserving of such a closeness right now. But is it about you? That's the question. Is what about me? the closeness, the connection, the what you're going to be feeling in a few minutes when you do pour out your heart and soul? Is it about you? I'm definitely in the mix there somewhere. I mean, hopefully I wouldn't be necessarily the center of it all, but there's, it's about me and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's me and Hashem trying to figure it all out. But when it becomes more about my children, hmm. then the voices of you're not worthy are mamish clearly the Yitzhah Hara. It's true. Maybe it's not about you. Maybe you're not worthy, but it's not, the end game is not that it's about you. By Asaph, it was all about him. Him, him, him. A reporter just called me about two hours ago. Wanted to get my take about Burning Man. Okay. Yeah, he opened. I like, prefaced by saying, "Listen, I do a lot of weird articles and stuff, and you know, wacky stuff, and you never know what to expect." And I wanted to get a rabbi's uh, response, opinion regarding Burning Man, if it's idolatry or not, if it's a vodazara or not. That's interesting. Well, yeah, I told him, "Look, I, I have no, I really don't know. I have a few friends that hey, go to these to to Burning Man. I just don't know." The point of why I'm bringing it up is because he said to me, he had spoken to a rabbi right before me, who coined, he had a very interesting definition of a, of a vodazara, of idol worship. Idol worship is when I try to, ex- to remove the concept of God and put the concept of me in the place of God. That was his explanation of it. Esav wanted the brachas because he felt, he really did felt that he deserved it. And that he felt that if he would receive brachas, he'd be more powerful than the source of blessing. Hmm. Yaakov's not under that illusion at all. So Yaakov stays in that place of unworthiness. And what does his mother say to him? She says, listen, boy, chick, it's not just about you. Through this bracha, there's 12 tribes that are going to come to the world, pave the way for the Jewish people to reclaim home one day, to come back to Eretz Yisrael after many years of exile all the different tribes, all the different ways of connecting to Hashem. If you're going to stand in this place of piety and out of a holy reason say, I'm not on the level, then guess what? You just took down the whole world. More or less. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the, the wisdom, I guess the, I guess if I had to take what, we, what, what we've been discussing today and try to, to uh, you know, put it into words of blessings or in a prayer, um, there's something that's called what we learned, you and I learned last week, anivut meruma, which means conniving and false humility. When your humility comes in the way of other people's receiving of blessings, it cannot be holy. It can't be the Yetzir Tov that is telling you, you're not on the level, you're not worthy. It can't. It just can't be. But when it's just, when it comes in a place of, I'm not worthy, God, but please keep on talking to me because despite the fact that I'm worthy or not, bigger things need to happen. That's the lesson that Rebecca tried to teach her son, Isaac, uh, Jacob. And where do we learn this from? Because she felt the most unworthy. Where did she come from? Look at the house that she came from. She's basically, she had to work through this her whole life. Being taken from her parents' house to meeting Isaac that first time that we see last Shabbos in a place called, uh, well, really, Chazal say he was, he was out in the field. He was praying in the field of the Migdash. When she sees him, what happens to her? She literally falls off her camel. But, but why? Because she was just so stunned from his beauty? Could be. But many of the commenters explain it because she saw that this was going to be her future husband, the future father of her children, and she felt unworthy. I always think about that encounter that, you know, Avram sends off Eliezer to go find Yitzchak a wife. And Yitzchak is waiting. And he's thinking, and maybe he's concerned. And he goes out into the fields, and he talks about it with God. And in the middle of that conversation, sharing who's going to be my wife, is she going to be good? I mean, the whole weight of the Jewish people is on my shoulders. Is she going to be pretty? Is she going to be nice? I mean, who is this person? Oh my gosh, you know, what's going to be? And in the middle of that conversation, Hashem already answers him. It's like so beautiful. Like an amazing, just perfect um, like that he, Yitzchak really introduces this idea of having a sicha in the afternoon. And so, you know, we've been learning a lot together, Rabbi Shlomo and I. And 
all of the Torahs, they all seem to be coming together right now. Every time I open a book, I'm just reading the same thing in different languages. Correct. And here we have now Yaakov Avinu, Ish Tam Yoshevo Alim. And now for a couple of weeks now, we've just been talking about what it is to be Tam. So we've translated as wholeheartedness, maybe purity, simplicity, just authenticity, just being Tam, just being real. And of all of the Avot, Yaakov was the most... Armumi, he was the most cunning, the most the one that had to steal the brachas and go to Lavan and deal with business and then run away. And and I just wonder, like to me, out of all of the Avot, Yaakov is the one that really Avram Avinu was like the Eretz Israel Jew. Yaakov Avinu is the Jew of the Galut. He's the he was the Av that spent yep. all the time in the yep. exile, more than any of the other patriarchs. And I just what is the balance of what it is to be Tam, what it is to be pure and authentic in wholehearted and then yet still in the world when you're dealing with conniving people when you're dealing with asav when you're dealing with lavan you got to deal with them the way they, they got to be dealt with and then still maintain a certain purity but that seems like a really slippery slope that once i would start cutting corners here in order to outsmart asav or outsmart lavan and i just don't know what the answer is uh how do you stay pure in tamim and yet deal with the outside world the way the outside world needs to be dealt with. I, I think your question is perfect. And I also think that we answered it already in this segment. If it's about you, there's no way to be Tom. Meaning, if the end game here is what do I get from this, there's no way to really be wholehearted. <laughs> but if what, if what you're doing is sincerely because it's basically like Jacob where he's trying to maintain the blessings because of his offspring, then it doesn't mean you're allowed now to do anything conniving per se. But what it does mean is that that's probably should be your guiding torch in this very tricky maze called this world. So it's easy when it's your children. Okay. Is there a way to channel it as... Am Israel, that what I'm doing now is really for the betterment of the Jewish people, for the betterment of the world, or meaning, what are the what are the kind of modes of operation that we're allowed to operate in? I once, I, if there's anyone that knows the how to, once I'm in the picture, it's like I am immediately lost. There's too many personal right. agendas. Right. There's too many personal outcomes. I re- recognize that. So if I'm now trying to act on behalf of the settlement movement in Judea, on behalf of the Jews of the world that are not yet in Israel, on behalf of something that's larger than myself, would that fall into the same category? I don't think I could ever, I don't think anyone can tell you that. It's all just inside. I think it's, you're you're dealing with, I think, knowing yourself in the, you know, the brutal journey of getting to know oneself, sticking it, sticking to authenticity the whole way. I don't know if there's any, I don't know if anyone can tell you there are clear guidelines it brings me back to to Reb Shlomo Karbach said where, you know, there's two Torahs. There's Beshifta Chabav Yisecha Velechta Chavaderch. There's the Torah of what I learn when I'm in my sitting in my home in the base medrash in the shul davening learning what what our sages have already mapped out for us. That you do this, you don't do this. Then there's the Torah of Uvelechta Chavaderch. All the things you can only learn by going out and walking the streets of the world and going through these life-changing experiences live on the spot and begging God to be with you at every given second. Look, I don't think there's any clear methodology here other than always asking Hashem to reawaken the awareness or the rutzon and the drive to always be wholehearted no matter what. As much as we can give clear definitions, I feel maybe possibly another thing could be that as long as I feel that I'm worthy of doing what I'm doing, Maybe that's not so hot. Do you feel worthy to be an advocate of the Jewish people? No. Do you feel an obligation? Of course. I, th- I this is what I feel like there was a But that's a huge difference. There was a a, a piska that I read, I think in Mikhtav Meliyahu at the very beginning. And he said that sometimes in times of war, 15-year-old boys are, become little class commanders because we have to go out to battle and there's no one here. So listen, you 15 year old, you're getting a promotion and you got to go do what you got to do. Here's a gun. And that happened in 1948. And that happens, you know, that just happens at wartime. And I feel like right now we're at wartime and all of a sudden, well, I've just been promoted to, you know, 
be on the show and just try to spread the light and create a headquarters and try to do what we can do. But do I feel worthy? Are you kidding me? I'm looking at just the pictures in your office here. Do I feel worthy? Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, look at all these gadolin that are like just around. Like, what am I even trying to do? But I feel like, well, if, if I don't do it, no one will do it. So I got to do what I got to do. But I definitely don't come with any, uh, I feel worthy here. Definitely not. There are plenty of people that do. They feel I'm worthy of such holy tasks. I'm worthy. I'm on the level. I deserve to ad- be an advocate because I'm worthy. That's not our way. Jacob Avinu's way is I'm not worthy, and yet I still have to go out and do what, God, what I believe Hashem needs me to do in this world. It seems like a lot of the Nevi'im, a lot of the prophets were like that. Moshe Rabbeinu was like, what are you, sending me? You want me to go? I mean, come on. <laughs> Look Moshe, at me. Moshe, Moshe argued with God, send my brother. The Midrash says he actually asked Hashem to, to send Eliyahu and Avi to go and do the job. Of course, that, that, that's who we learn from. What's very sad today is that today when there's elections for anything, any chief, I don't want to say chief rabbi, but any, any holy elections regarding you know, uh, authority in the, in the religious department, you don't have people on a platform saying, I really don't deserve to, you know, to be doing this. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's always, is there anyone more capable than me? Does anyone understand the Jewish people better than me? Hmm. You know, we're sitting here, friends, with Jeremy and I are sitting here in a basement in the hills of Judea and um, really offering our prayers with all of you, looking up to God and saying, we know we're not worthy. <laughs> we're not under any illusion that we're worthy of, of, the, of the bounty, of the, of the gifts you've bestowed upon us and the opportunities to touch so many people. Please, God, may it never, ever be about us, ever. And despite that, may I have all the holy conviction to go out and, and spread light and receive blessings for your name's sake, with love. And to understand that, only you can teach me, Hashem. I can learn every book in the world to understand how that works. Only you can reveal it to me. So I don't think that uh, there's anything wrong with saying those words. Mom is putting it on God, saying, the balance here seems almost impossible. Almost impossible. To, on the one hand, feel unworthy and yet still go out and do good in the world. But this is what we learned from our portion, from Jacob. This is what he learned from his mother, Rivka. I don't know where she learned it from. Because she came from a very wicked house, but her neshama knew it. So our neshamas know a lot more than our head lets us know right now. May our neshamas be revealed to ourselves, to the world. Ultimately, just to bring your great and sweet and redemptive name to all mankind. Amen. Till the next time, dear friends. Shabbat shalom. All the best.